That was cool, the whole light thing. Uh, that was awesome. They didn't do that for you. <laughs> I'm glad they didn't. <laughs> um, I want to start with something you said uh, I was reading, because you have an interesting background. So before we jump into Messenger and the platform, you were talking about how you grew up during the Cold War as a kid in Russia. And you said getting to San Francisco in Silicon Valley was like going to the moon. What was it? What was so appealing? <laughs> Interesting. The, uh, I, I haven't talked about it in a while. The, uh, what was so appealing, that was uh, in my mind, and that materialized to be that, uh, one of the most creative places on Earth. Uh, that was a place where I thought amazing things are happening. And I sort of, when I was growing up, I was thinking it would be cool to be a small part of that. So when opportunity presented itself, I jumped at it, and uh, I'm glad I have. And, and fast forward, you've sold a gaming company. You're a board member of Goodreads, which sold uh, to Amazon. You always have had a good sense of what's coming next when it comes to technology. Um, now you're working on conversation uh, and messenger at Facebook. So what do you think the most fundamental change uh, in how we communicate online will be in the next decade? I think one of the things that is going to happen is that more and more of conversations between people and businesses are going to start migrating towards messaging platforms. And we try to uh, be part of that move. Uh, people like to call businesses less and less and less. And if you start thinking about it, it's not the most efficient thing. Uh, do you really want to be on hold? Do you really want to necessarily talk to somebody when you can simply message to a business the same way you message to any other person and have a fast answer back? And we think more and more of that is going to start happening. We try to build tools that will allow people and businesses to be able to participate in that. And that's one of the biggest changes that I can identify for going forward. You guys have been building that. I mean, a, a couple of years ago, you opened up the platform, Messenger platform, to developers uh, to build out different bots for businesses. I know at the time, people were saying, are people going to use bots? What's going to happen? Um, so fast forward two years later, what's worked? What hasn't? What are you saying? Yeah, all good things take time. Uh, now uh, we have over 100,000 developers who are building uh, conversational UIs inside Messenger. And it's a big number. Uh, it's a small number if you compare it to 6 million advertisers that Facebook has in its ecosystem. Uh, but it's way bigger than uh, it was when we started two years ago. What worked is that simple conversations where bots are handling parts of it, and then when it gets into the territory that bot is not ready to answer, it switches to the humans. Those combined interfaces and combined experiences are really taking off. Uh, a lot of that is happening in Asia, but a bunch of that is happening in uh, US and in Western Europe as well. And so we're excited seeing that growing. So how do you envision kind of the role of bots and chatbots? I mean, is it the future 1-800 number? Is it more than that? I mean, what do you envision? It needs to start from making existing conversations simpler. And that comes down to customer service and a bunch of things in customer service. It gets down to the telephone tree that is way more efficient to be handled through a bot in Messenger than it is to be on the phone when you have to. If that, press 1. If this, press 2. Right. If you can just see it in front, in front of you in the thread, you can just read and press whatever button you want to press. So all of those experiences that are not efficient today and happening over the phone, they need to move first because it's more efficient for them to be on Messenger. And from there, the sky is the limit. One of the things that we are actually announcing today is our NLP capabilities are now not only limited to English, but they, can, they are now extended to other languages, to uh, uh, Portuguese including, but also French and other languages. And uh, that would allow developers in uh, all different countries to start tapping into the natural language processing capabilities that uh, we as Facebook can provide, which will make those bots more efficient, which will make those bots to understand more of what users want to talk to them about, and which will make those interactions even more fluid going forward. 
And you're announcing the new Messenger platform 2.2, so explain, because it's going to give people the ability to interact with bots in a different capacity, right? Yes, so uh, <clears throat> that original platform that you referenced, what we introduced 1.0, that is a long time ago. At this point, we are on version 2.2. Two, which we are releasing today. And there are actually a bunch of capabilities. So I would encourage everybody who is interested to go and read the API docs uh, when they're available. But the bottom line there is that one of the biggest things that we are releasing there is what we call a plugin. And that sales or customer service plugin is something that any developer uh, can put on their property, on their website. And the conversation will start there. It's a chat conversation. It would work the same way it's working in Messenger right now, but it would be another way for people to start chat conversations that will duplicate itself inside Messenger from the property of that developer. And the use cases are plenty, but imagine if you are on someone's website and you see one of those chat plugins, you start asking questions. You don't necessarily get answers that you want to get right now. But the customer service representative or the salesperson replies later, and that reply is coming to you in Messenger. You can start and uh, have that conversation in Messenger, and the context is never lost. It's the same session, it's the same conversation, the business knows who you are, and you know what you're talking about with that business as well. So we think it's more efficient for everyone, and we are excited about that. That's one of the things that developers and businesses have been asking for a long time. So we are happy that we are finally putting it out there. You have, a, you have an example of it, right? How it'll actually play out? Oh, yeah. I actually have an uh, example. Uh, if the guys mm -hmm. will allow that, let me just play that video really quickly. <laughs> That's Great. it. Um, so that's launching today. I would, I'd be interested to know, as you deal with bots and whatnot, what ethical considerations do you guys talk about at Facebook when it comes to creating bots and determining how they're going to interact with humans? We, we try to be very transparent with regards to making sure that people understand what's going on and people understand they're talking to bots versus uh, real human beings. We, for us, it's also obviously with, we are in advertising business and we want to make sure that people understand when they're dealing with ads versus when they're dealing with organic content and uh, making sure that separation is clear is another ethical dimension that we are trying to be very cognizant of. But between these two, uh, we are doing everything what we can on the integrity side to ensure the uh, cleanliness of the ecosystem because we believe that in the long run only clean ecosystems survive. I'd be curious, I don't know, how, how many of you guys have been talking about something in real life and then you somehow, you're going to know where I'm going with this, but you somehow <laughs> get a related ad in your Facebook feed? Has that happened to anyone? OK, so that's happened to some people. So there have been rumors, and I know that Facebook has shot this down, but that the company uses the device's microphone to listen in. I think people are always wondering about transparency. So now that we got you here, can you explain why that happens? What, how do you account for that? Yeah, uh, so I will be happy to shut it down one more time. <laughs> uh, uh, no, we're not using anyone's microphone to do any of that. We're also not using the context of your conversations uh, in order to target ads. None of that is happening. The, uh, the way it is happening is just by the virtue of uh, people spending a lot of time on Facebook and on Messenger. So if you are in many conversations at the same time, and you're talking about a bunch of different things. But let's say you and I are talking about something. We are having my wife and I have a lot of conversations on Messenger. At some point, I say something, let's go. Uh, we need to buy bananas tonight because we want bananas. So 
there are so many things that we mentioned. Bananas is one of them, and I remember most things that I mentioned. Then later on in the newsfeed, I can see an ad for banana. Statistically, if you look through the math and you actually compute that, and there were a bunch of studies out there, that is at some point very likely to happen given the amount of content that you are talking about with your friends and given the amount of time that you spend on newsfeed, at some point these two sets will intersect. But when they do, the human bias is that let's just jump to the simplest possible explanation. And then you just do that. You don't want to go into the statistics. You don't want to figure out that statistically the probability of something like that happening is actually going to increase over time. Uh, and you also don't necessarily, not everyone has a math background, uh, but the uh, actual statistical probability of something like that happening, given amounts of time that people are spending and that increasing, is actually pretty high. And that generally explains most of those biases. With what you guys have just launched, I mean, this whole idea is our lives are increasingly going through Facebook. Now, when we look at even customer service now launching on sites through Facebook, Facebook essentially is a huge, huge part of our lives. Um, if you look at, and uh, going back to the United States, just last week you had Facebook testifying, trying to explain the weaponization of the platform. Um, Facebook revealed that 126 million Americans may have been exposed to the content generated uh, on its platform by Russian government-linked uh, troll farms. So, you know, that's a big moment, I can imagine, for Facebook, and that's a very big number. Being on the inside, Take us to the inside, Stan. Do you think that Facebook now fully has a grasp on the problem? Um, and I'd also be curious, to what extent is it still going on? Yeah, so the, uh, that's obviously uh, a big issue for us. So the most straightforward for me to answer, actually, is to go back to what Mark said on the earnings call that we had whenever it was last week, I think. And um, he practically said uh, that we're going to put uh, safety and security uh, of our community ahead of even profitability. And that's how it's approached internally. Uh, what it means is that there is really no shortage of attention uh, towards this issue. And uh, we're all hands on trying to figure out all the best things to uh, tackle the issue. And when the CEO of the public company, CEO and the founder of a public company like Facebook, goes on the record uh, while doing earnings call and saying something like that, that's not taken lightly outside nor inside the company. And Facebook generally is extremely good in making sure that if it focuses on something, it does it very, very well. Uh, when Facebook declares that move to mobile is the number one priority for us, it was an amazing progress that was achieved in a very short period of time. And uh, this issue is handled very similarly. As I said, there is no shortage of attention internally towards that. People are working very hard on making sure we fully understand everything and prevent that from happening going forward. And we are focusing on it like there is no tomorrow. What you're essentially saying is it's like all hands on deck right now, trying to get, get on top of the problem. Look, there is uh, obviously uh, sometimes things when there are like right and wrong, and there was a lot of very clear wrong that was happening on the platform, and uh, we are trying to make sure that is not happening anymore. So many times, these tech companies, it's, we're just the pipes, you know? This, it's just tech companies that said we're not responsible for the content that goes through them. Do you think, at this point, Facebook has a responsibility to protect democracy? I'm going to get back to what Mark said, which is we're going to put safety and security sort of ahead of everything what we do, including profitability. And uh, we're going to just do that, and we're going to do that very well, and uh, we're going to see where it leads us. But uh, we're going to lead our way through that. And, but I can imagine um, there are the ethical conversations happening behind closed doors that every tech company is facing because it's not as clear cut uh, as, okay, we just get rid of this content. There's a lot of gray area. So 
uh, you know, what are the ethical considerations you guys have of policing content that might be Russian propaganda linked or bad actors, but also balancing free speech? Because you don't want to go one way and go too far. I can imagine that's a conversation you guys are happening, uh, you guys are having. There are a lot of conversations that obviously are happening uh, everywhere in our communities. The the best way, and I kind of said that, the best way I'm personally thinking about that, again, there is a black and white. And we need to make sure that we take care of black first. Uh, and it's pretty obvious what needs to be done and how it needs to be dealt with. Once we tackle that, then we're going to have an opportunity and ability to think about everything else. But until we are there, we should just, as you said, uh, hands on deck and fix what we need to fix. But it is difficult to decipher between like a political fact and an opinion, wouldn't you say? I mean, and, and should Facebook be responsible for doing that? Those are all hard questions. Again, like if you are really, I don't think we're going to be able to tackle them in two minutes. I, <laughs> okay. will, say, I will say there is like two hours of congressional testimony right. that Colin went through last week. There is Mark earnings call. If anybody in the audience have deep interest in it, I would encourage you guys to go and listen to what we said there. What is your plan, um, because we have two minutes, what is your plan to get to the next to two billion users on Messenger? What do you guys have to do to, to get to that milestone? We have to continue to provide utility to everybody. We have to continue to be able to do something for people that um, they can't get done anywhere else. And that's hard, but uh, that's possible. And Enabling people to business this conversation is one of those things. Uh, it's just so inefficient and it's done in such a way that both businesses and users are generally dissatisfied with that. And we think we can actually empower people and businesses to have way better relationship and that would be worldwide. And if we are to be able to do that, then there is even more utility to the platform and that will enable our growth like it always used to. It always was growing because there was an amazing product market fit and it will have to continue to grow as such. You were, uh, you were at PayPal before and you were kind of obsessed with this idea of the digital wallet and how we were all going to be using our phones. So how yes. have you taken that mentality and that obsession from PayPal and taken that to, to Messenger? The, uh, that's an awesome question. One way is that we are looking at that, and we actually announced uh, one of those steps in that direction yesterday with enabling P2P capabilities in UK, expanding from US. Uh, one of the ways we are thinking about it is that we want to be in payments, but we don't want to make any money in payments. So we want to be everyone's friends in payments, and the reason why is because we want to enable as much of advertising as possible possible. And that means making the trip between people seeing the ad and people actually acting on it and buying something as a result of that ad or consuming some sort of service as a result of that ad to make that pass as short as possible. Having payments being part of that equation is very important because if you can pay with one click, it's way easier compared to scenario where you have to go and enter your credit card or figure out some other way to pay. And that's what we are trying to enable. And as such, we are trying to bring in as many partners as possible. In the US, we announced a bunch of partnerships with PayPal, actually. That's going very well. But we are working very closely with Amex. We are very, working very closely with Visa and with MasterCard. And uh, all of that for the sake of enabling our users to have payment credentials on file, but not necessarily digital wallet. They can have their digital wallet anywhere else, but if there is access to that digital wallet from their messenger account, then the transactions will be happening smoother, and that will help people, businesses, and advertisers alike. I know we have to, to wrap it up, but um, I saw that you came to San Francisco. It was like 1994, and unless and, yeah. and this article was wrong, it said you had $20 in your pocket. And since then... I might have it might have been 25. Like, okay, yeah. so since then, but, you've sold companies for millions. Uh, you've had massive success in Silicon Valley. Uh, and you're sitting at Facebook, which, yes, is facing some really interesting, challenging uh, questions. If you could look at a, a quality that's helped determine your success um, in yourself, what do, you, what do you think it would be? Interesting. The, uh, so I was, 
it's a personal one, but I was doing a lot of things in consumer internet when it wasn't cool. What helped is that I was a good software engineer, and I also always had a lot of interest in psychology, and I probably was the only one uh, who had such an intersection back in the 90s, because people would be like, I'm interested in psychology, or I'm interested in computer science. I was interested in both. And then when consumer internet came about, I'm like, wow, that's what consumer internet is. It's an intersection of software development and psychology. And once I realized that, everything became way easier, because you just need to try to figure out what people want. And if you know how to make it happen, because you understand software engineering, you can put these two things together and uh, good things happen. So that's what helped me. Great. Cool. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you.